Um, it is such an honor to be here today uh, in this amazing company of uh, the presenters themselves. When I first got the invitation and saw who else would be here, I was just beside myself with excitement, but also with the attendees. And um, I really, the conversations I've had with those of you who are attending so far have been fantastic. So thank you all for coming and hanging in there and staying with us. Um, and really, my kudos to the organizers for all that they have done, uh, Natalie, Karina, and, and Maggie, um, bringing together, again, this amazing group of people, putting together um, such a great conference. Uh, I'm deeply grateful to be included here, and I'm grateful to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for helping us have this discussion. Uh, ironically, although it is often considered the worst position, I am glad to be the last speaker of the day, and that's because throughout the entire day I've been scribbling in the margins of my paper, you know, this connects to what Ingrid said, this connects to what Maria said, this is connecting to what Sean said. Um, and that's really was the aim of my talk, and so I'm asking all of you to basically do that same thing, that as I'm speaking, my goal is to have you reflecting back on what we've learned today and really thinking about what I call the repercussive effects of incarceration, which in this talk today are looking specifically at the people who are one step away from that incarcerated body. So we have focused today on the people who are themselves incarcerated, and I'm not now going to ask you to take everything you've learned and think about how that might impact the mothers, the fathers, the siblings, uh, the loved ones of those people um, who themselves are not necessarily the targets of the criminal justice system, but whose lives are intimately entwined with it. So if you're fading, it's the end of the afternoon, that was the take home message right there. <laughs> the rest of it, um, you'll get it down. So to frame my talk, um, I'm a sociologist who primarily conducts qualitative research, and I'm very fortunate to work with a team of people um, who value interdisciplinary multi-method research. Uh, this is a recent publication by my colleagues um, that details in four different case studies about what that really looks like in practice for us. So we bring together epidemiologists, anthropologists, clinicians, as I say, I'm a sociologist, people coming from different methodological frameworks, and then we all hash it out together, um, working with each other's strengths. So I really put together my talk today with this model in mind, and what I'm hoping to do is contribute some ground level detail and context to the overarching conversation of this symposium, and really to provide some food for thought about what aspects of families and relationships would be important to consider in some of these larger scale studies like Mike was just talking about, um, and to also think about how we might inquire about and measure the issues that I'll be discussing. Uh, so most of my work to date has focused on female partners of incarcerated men and then on male female couples after a man's release from prison. And I'm going to be drawing on this entire body of work which dates back to 1995 today, so I'm not going into the methods, it would not be a good use of my time. But there's just a couple of things that are important to note. Um, one, for the focus of this symposium on health disparities, um, it's important to note that across all of the studies, as they say there are five of them dating back to 1995, the majority of our participants have been African American. And this is simply the sampling issue that we've primarily used convenient sampling methods at a prison and in impoverished neighborhoods. And as we've been hearing today, um, African Americans are disproportionately rec uh, represented in those areas. Um, I also wanted to note that all of the dyads that I'll be talking about today are people who are in their late 30s through their early 50s. So this gets into some of the questions um, talking about aging and those health-related issues. We often think of incarceration, I think, as like youngsters who kind of might be a little more resilient in their health. Um, but I'm talking about folks who have who've moved on in the life course. Uh, this work, I began my work at um, San Quentin State Prison, which I've labeled for you here. It's the nice big red star up there to the north of San Francisco. Um, so I started out my work at, at San Quentin and based in the visiting center, which is located outside of the gates there. And I was fortunate to work with colleagues from the University of California, San Francisco, providing HIV prevention interventions to women who were visiting incarcerated men. And then I also conducted my ethnographic research that Corina was kind enough to mention uh, that turned into my book, Doing Time Together, Love and Family in the Shadow of the Prison, which was a study of women who were in relationships with men. Uh, so a lot of that work took place while the men were in prison because we were meeting women who were coming to visit them. But due to the longitudinal nature of some of the studies and also due to the, um, what for me was a great privilege of working on sequential studies in the same site, I got to know people over time. And so that gave me a chance to follow women through cycles of men's release and return. The more recent work I've been doing is located in the city of Oakland. And again, I, I put it on the map for you here. So you see San Francisco uh, on the peninsula there. And then about 12 miles away across the bay is the city of Oakland, which is a mid-sized city. It's actually quite varied in terms of uh, socioeconomic class and, and ethnicity, but it does have a substantial population of very impoverished African-Americans. Uh, 
The first study that brought me to Oakland was the study of male-female couples after a man's release from prison. And so we did street-based and venue-based recruitment, um, finding men who had been released from prison in the last year, and then someone they identified as a female partner. She also had to agree that she was his female partner. Um, and this was interesting. I note our sampling methods here because a lot of people are like, how are you going to find these guys? You can't just walk down the street and ask somebody if they just got out of prison. And speaking to these neighborhood issues, you can do that in high incarceration neighborhoods. It's really not that stigmatized and it's not such a big deal for folks. Um, so we were grateful to, to find people who were willing to share their time with us. Then I'm currently involved in a study with my colleague Jennifer Lorvik, who's here with me, um, called the Urban Health Study 2. And this is part of the National Institutes of Health Seek, Test, Treat, and Retain initiative. So we're providing community-based HIV testing to active substance users. And then for people who test HIV positive, we have an intensive case management component that really focuses on promoting continuity of care as people cycle in and out of the um, incarceration system. So just to note on that, that the participants I'll be talking today are all people we're following in the case management com component. Um, I would really like to put forth at this moment in the day that it's really important to consider the relationships of people who are incarcerated and who have recently been released, because this is how we bring women back into the carceral health equation. Ingrid was talking about the very important issue of the health of women who are themselves incarcerated, which is definitely important. And, but if we want to find more women who are infected by incarceration, as I say, we just need to go one step beyond the incarcerated person. The vast majority of people who are incarcerated are men, and the vast majority of people who are taking care of incarcerated people or recent released people are women. And this includes when the incarcerated person or the recently released person is a woman. Um, so when we go out and we look for people who are involved um, in the relationships with folks, we're, we're finding women. The other thing that I wanted to emphasize, and again, this is all in synchronicity with what people have been talking about today, we're not really talking about incarceration and release as these sort of stagnant and separate things. I would argue we're talking about pre-incarceration and re-incarceration. Again, I'm speaking today about people who are in their late 30s to early 50s. This was not the first time that the majority of these folks had been uh, through an incarceration experience. So it was a re-incarceration for the men. Um, and because of the social factors we've been talking about, uh, when people get out, it's very, very hard to stay out of incarceration. And so often that release period that we're calling re-entry, which I appreciate Sean's uh, problematization of that in and of itself, it's in some ways just a pre-incarceration before people are getting sent back. Um, so another piece then to bring into this is we're not looking at a stagnant phenomenon. And for women, we're also not looking at one relationship. Uh, many women are managing streams of brothers, sons, fathers, uncles, partners who are in and out of jail and prison, often different facilities. So to illustrate this, I have a quotation from a woman I'll call Natasha. Everything today is a pseudonym. And I had asked her the question, how many people do you know who are incarcerated right now? And she was very overwhelmed by trying to answer this question. So we whittled it down and she just focused on San Quentin where we were conducting the interview. So she said, I asked my cousin how to get to San Quentin because she come here all the time because her husband is here. I know my brother-in-law is here and my godson's father is here. Um, my uncle just left here. So a few people. I might know some more people here. I just, I just don't know. I think I might have some cousins up here because I haven't seen them in a while. So as a sociologist, there's a lot in that statement that's very interesting. But what, I, again, I want to put forth to this audience is that this is a statement that should make us very concerned about this woman's health. <laughs> and one of the ways that we can be concerned about is the fact that she is visiting her husband on the day that I interview her. But there are all these other people she might be visiting, too. And we have some literature, um, the start of some literature, I think there needs to be more research on this, of the health impacts of jail and prison visiting for people here who might have had that experience or know people who have. It often involves long hours in the car followed by long hours waiting, usually waiting in areas like this. This is the visitor waiting area at San Quentin. You know, uncomfortable uh, wooden benches, no amenities, no, you know, in San Quentin actually outside they just have a little vending machine, there's nowhere to buy food. Um, a very dingy toilet, and often in sanitary conditions, and things don't get that much better when you get into the prison for your actual visit. So I've had a lot of women talking about backaches, headaches, migraines, chronic pain, um, all sorts of these kinds of issues that might be related to visiting. I think it's also important when we think about incarceration in general, like how people could be spending their time otherwise. So prison visiting takes up a lot of women's time, and it's usually time on the weekends. So we could think of that as time that people could be spending catching up on sleep from the work week, of being out with their children, perhaps of exercising, so other more health-promoting activities. 
There are other reasons that we could worry about Natasha's health. And again, there's a recent and growing literature, um, thanks to people in this room and people who are attending and colleagues elsewhere, um, on the stresses and strains of having so many people gone from homes and neighborhoods, what it's like to try to make up for all those uh, people who are away, the loss of any financial or practical support those people might have provided, housing instability or children's guardianship issues that arose as a re result of someone's sentence, the despair of mothers uh, raising children while fathers are detained, the trauma of watching a parent be handcuffed. All of these things are going to raise mental health and physical health uh, issues along the way. But against this backdrop that I'm painting, I wanted to take us through several case studies that provide insight into the repercussive effects of incarceration on family members and loved ones' health in less straightforward and more counterintuitive ways. And this is where I feel the richness of the qualitative work in the ethnography can be very helpful. So the first thing I'd like to do is dig deeper into this concept of the family support, which I think is often provo promoted in a very rosy light. Family support is a good thing, and it's going to help people get better. And I'd like to argue that this is an incarceration health nexus for women, that incarceration creates a context in which women experience high expectations to caretake, urged on by these ideas that family and social support can reduce recidivism and be a redeeming force in, the for uh, lives, in their loved ones' lives. And in my analysis, by shifting the burden of rehabilitation away from the public infrastructure and many of the things that Ernest Drucker was speaking about this morning, and shifting it onto families during and after incarceration, we are actually harming women's health and well-being as they respond to pressure for them to be there for extremely high-needs people who require intensive professional and systems-level assistance rather than just family support. So again, to refer to, to Professor Drucker's um, talk this morning, where else could we be spending those millions of dollars? And again, to referring to this idea of where are the women who are involved in incarceration, they're left on the outside where those dollars are not being spent. So, as I say, this is the backdrop um, for these, these case studies. The first dyad I wanted to talk about is a sibling relationship. Uh, Carl and Kimberly are brother and sister in a very close re relationship with a lot of love between them. Um, Carl is triply diagnosed, meaning that he's HIV positive, he has substance abuse issues and mental health issues. And over the 18 months that we've been following him, Carl has been incarcerated in county jail multiple times. And then when he's not in jail, he's on parole, which for those of you who have been following California, things are getting very confusing in the California criminal justice system. So just trust me, he goes to jail, but then he comes out and he's on parole. Um, so Kimberly provides a lot of support to Carl. And you know, most notably, this is one of the questions from our urban health study, what is your current living situation? I would imagine that this is how Carl answered this question, a family member's place. He knows that when he comes out of jail, he can go to Kimberly's home. Um, she's also the primary point of contact for our case manager, um, our social worker who's doing the case management for Carl. So she'll actually proactively call our social worker when Carl is missing or if she's worried about him or if he's gone back to jail. Um, when he is in jail, she puts money on his books and she visits him weekly. And as I say, in general, they have a very bonded and meaningful relationship with a lot of love um, expressed between the two of them. So from this level, we would say, okay, this is great. You know, this is very good family support, and this has got to be a positive influence in Carl's life. And I'm not arguing that it's not, but I wanted to, us to look at Kimberly for a moment. So one thing that's important to know about Kimberly is she's confined to a wheelchair um, because she was violently assaulted a few years ago, uh, receiving multiple gunshot wounds from an ex-boyfriend. Um, so she's now paraplegic and in a lot of chronic pain. And in fact, Carl is not legally allowed to live with Kimberly because she has a prescription for medical marijuana. And so he's not allowed to be around a controlled substance, even if it's prescribed to his sister. Um, there's a lot of stress and worry then that comes up around this idea that each of them is kind of jeopardizing the other by being in the same household. And things like this can get exasperated, uh, exacerbated once, for instance, um, three parole officers came looking for Carl when there was a warrant out for his arrest, and they searched Kimberly's house with their guns drawn. And given that she's a gunshot wound victim, this was very traumatizing for her. Um, Carl also will take, uh, we were talking earlier about pharmaceuticals, and Kimberly does have prescription Vicodin, which Carl uh, might use when he's spiraling back into his drug use. And Kimberly will articulate that her anxiety around all of this actually does decrease when Carl's reincarcerated because she knows where he is and she feels that he's safe. But her caretaking of him is hard on her uh, when he's incarcerated also. So I'm very grateful that Alexis was speaking about uh, financial costs before. And if we think about the financial costs of visiting and supporting an incarcerated person and the burden that place on family members, 
Um, but also this I just mapped out for you the, the route that Kimberly has to travel to see her brother. This is 30 miles as the crow flies. We think about jails as being local facilities, but um, Oakland people who go to jail are actually sent to Santa Rita, which is our, uh, I believe it's the fifth largest county jail in the United States. Uh, and so she needs to take a uh, ride on our, our transit system that takes about 45 minutes, costs her $4.15, and then take a bus. Again, remember, this is a woman who's confined to a wheelchair. She doesn't have any, anybody who can go with her. So that's all told, you know, almost a two-hour round trip and just over $10 for a woman who's receiving $900 a month on Social Security for a one-hour visit um, at the jail. She was not permitted more time than that. So altogether, this is just to show there's a lot of physical and emotional wear and tear on a woman whose health is already very vulnerable, and that even when Carl is not behind bars, incarceration-related harms arise in the form of his parole supervision and his untreated substance use, which Kimberly is left to cope with on her own. Another case, um, we have Laverne and Derek. Laverne is the mother of two, and she's been in a relationship for six years and married for five to Derek, who's a man with severe substance use and mental health issues. And he's returned from prison to her health, uh, house multiple times. And they actually first entered our couple study together, so he had recently been released. But when we contacted them for a second interview, he had been reincarcerated for assaulting Laverne. Um, we went ahead and I interviewed Laverne for the second interview, and she told me that during the course of her marriage, she started to have pa panic attacks, and that once when she went to the hospital to seek treatment for one of them, she was involuntarily um, committed for a 72-hour mandatory hold because she was believed to be a harm for, to herself, which actually discouraged her from ever seeking medical treatment for her panic attacks again. So in addition to talking about injuries and anxiety that her relationship has caused her, in one interview package, she, uh, passage, she spoke very eloquently of how prisoners tap into the trope of family support that I was speaking of before. So she said to me, you know, you have some people on drugs, and they like go and leave for four or five days. He wasn't that type. But it was days when I was like, I wish you would go for four or five days. To ask her to clarify, you wish he would, you, he would go. Yeah, because it'd be so irritating coming in and asking me, asking me, you know, for the money and the games and the manipulation that go around. You know, the things that they say they will do just to get the money so they can get the money from you instead of having to go out and commit a crime. You get to a point where, okay, if you're going to rob a store, rob it, and then you deal with the consequences. I'm tired. It's four in the morning. I have to be at work at seven, and I'm dealing with you. And when I go to work, you're going to be asleep. So with all that she expresses, I think Laverne is a very powerful example of what I was speaking of before, the incarceration health nexus, where, through which women are mobilized to open their arms to and care for men who would be challenging even for very skilled mental health and substance use professionals. Um, and even despite the physical injuries and the panic attacks and all that Laverne was describing to me, she wanted to make it very clear that she was planning to reunite with Derek after his release. She said, I wanted to see help for him, and I didn't want to just walk away and throw my hands up because of the love I had for him. So expressing this very internalized sense of re responsibility for Derek, um, and that his re rehabilitation relies on her and leads her to prioritize that over her own well-being. We have an interesting uh, counter case to this, or alternative model, um, in Jimmy and Celeste. Uh, Jimmy is also triply diagnosed, um, but his partner Celeste has worked very distinctively to create her own life. And most uh, stands out the most to me is that she will not allow him to live with her. She has stable housing in an apartment, but Jimmy um, cannot come there, even though they've been in a relationship for quite a while. So this is what I would imagine Jimmy would have answered on our question, that he's in a halfway home. Um, and what's interesting about this is that Jimmy and Carl, the, the brother of Kimberly, have actually had pretty similar trajectories in the time that we've followed them, despite the fact that one is living with family and the other is not. But by not sharing her housing with Jimmy, Celeste has really limited her exposure to aspects of Jimmy's life that could affect her negatively in the way that we just heard Laverne talking about um, Derek's impact on her. And this brings me to one of um, someone earlier, now I'm, I think it was Maria, was talking about marriage rates. Uh, just to note that in our couple study, so you had to be be a couple to enroll in the study. And we had people who had been in very long relationships, and yet only 17% of our folks were legally married. So I think it really reminds us that we need to look at other ways to measure commitment or being in relationships, and to not over-romanticize also the health protective benefits of marriage, because at least in Celeste's case, um, not getting married is being protective to her health, which is in line with other work we've seen by Catherine Eden, Maria Kafalis, and others. 
So shifting gears, uh, at this point, I wanted to tie back into Alexis's work and the impact of all that she's talking about and all the other monetary difficulties faced by people who have criminal records, including difficulties finding a job, um, being discriminated against due to that criminal record. And so this is a less high needs person. I thought that was also important to put on the table that it's not only the triply diagnosed men uh, whose partners and siblings are having difficulties related to their incarceration. So Cornelia and Joseph also have a very long-term relationship, and it spanned multiple periods of Joseph's incarceration. And Cornelia was working, when I met her, she was working two jobs. She was attending night school, and she also um, visited Joseph at least weekly during the eight months that she was visiting at San Quentin when we knew her. Um, so when she was being interviewed at one point after Joseph had been released, Cornelia reflected on how things were going at home, and she really highlighted herself um, the challenges of Joseph's inability to find work due to his criminal record and the financial burden that this was placing on her. She said, to tell you the truth, it was better when he was in prison. I did so much better when he was locked up. I didn't have no problems with bills. I was able to go to the beauty shop and maybe get my hair done, or go to the nail shop and get my feet done, or go to the store and buy me an outfit or a pair of clothes. Or if I had the money, if my girlfriends wanted to go out or something, I was able to go out. But now since he's out, I have to ask my friend, can I borrow this? I'll pay you back. Can I borrow that? And Cornelia also talked about the difficulties that um, her financial situation uh, brought up with her own family. She said, oh, don't let me call my family. I thought you had a man. Why are you asking me for money? You have a man. So you messing with a sorry man who don't have no job. You wasn't raised like this. That's the stuff I hear, so I try not to ask them. Even though I know they would help me, if they know that I'm doing good for myself, but if they know that I'm taking care of a man, I'm not going to get that help. So I feel like this is a very rich passage again in so many ways, but I really want to draw our attention here to the health implications that are contained in what Cornelia says. So we can imagine that financial worries may trigger stress-related symptoms in both Cornelia and Joseph, uh, and housing and feeding two adults off of one person's wages may well translate into substandard housing um, and nutrition. But very importantly, I really love the way Cornelia talks about these things, getting her hair done, getting her nails done, going out with her friends, because I think that we can look at those as being frivolous things to care about at first. But in fact, when we really think about them, these are health-promoting activities that women are urged in all different kinds of media, um, all different sorts of forums that we should be doing to keep our blood pressure down, to keep our digestion going well, to you know, avoid migraines. These are all images I found when I Googled Oprah and uh, stress relief. And as I say, they're, you know, they're out there for women. And again, I don't want to be flippant because they're also out there in the literature and the science shows us that friends are important. Taking some downtime is important. And I think it's really critical for us to remember this is a woman working two jobs and going to night school and dealing with a husband in prison or a husband who can't find work when he's home. If anyone needs some stress relief, it's Cornelia, right? Um, and again, I want to just throw some numbers out there from the couple study, um, and this really ties into what Ingrid was talking about, a lung cancer and other things. 75% of the women in our couple studies were smokers enormously high, and we have to think that some of that is driven by stress. 27% um, of those women self-reported being di diagnosed with hypertension, 34% with anxiety, 36% with depression. So again, if we're thinking about women who need a little downtime, who need to be taking care of themselves, who need to be hanging out with friends, it's probably women who are under these levels of stress. And recast this way, we can see how health disparities may arise from seemingly small and easily mistaken for petty details, like not having enough pocket money to get your hair done or joining your friends for a movie. So I want to highlight this before I wrap up, um, which is just to keep it coming back to incarceration. All of these duos discussed so far really illustrate how the denial of housing and government entitlements and imposed sanctions due to people's criminals' convictions, as well as employment discrimination, make these men highly dependent on women in ways that undermine well-being really for both people. I'm, I, I think that the men suffer quite a few um, impacts on their well-being as well. I am focusing on women today. So I'm going to wrap up with this slide, and I want to explain the photos. The one on the left for you was taken actually by our social worker um, for the study that I mentioned before, Christina Powers. She took this on February 12th of 2013, and the sign there, this is in front of a church, and it says, these crosses represent the number of homicides in Oakland so far this year. I can guarantee you that that number has at least doubled since the time that she took this photo. The photo on your right um, is a place where one of our participants in the urban health study lives. This is actually a woman who lives here, and she calls this place the jungle. 
and you climb through this fence, however you can get there. This photo is taken by my co-ethnographer, uh, Andrea Lopez, and you go under the freeway overpass and back into an area that's uh, not, you can't see it from the sidewalk. So I chose these photos to illustrate um, Antoine, who is in his late 20s, unlike the other folks I've been talking about. And he really sees himself as a product of the state of California. He grew up in foster care. He then went into the juvenile justice system. And he's spent a lot of time in the adult prison system since then. He's another triply diagnosed man. And it would literally take me hours to explain to you all of the violence, the mental health challenges, and the physical health emergencies Antoine has survived since we met him just under a year ago. He has many family members in his circle, including his mother, siblings, cousins, and he's also had two partners in the time that we've been working with him. And he's shared housing um, with a variety of those people. And our observation is that with the exception of his current partner, who has been a source of stability and help, um, all of these other people have been triggers, as, as Ingrid was talking about before, for the escalation of Antoine's violence and the deterioration of his mental health. Some of his loved ones have their own incarceration histories, including some of the women, again, to not forget that women do go to jail and prison. Um, many of them are addicted to drugs, have mental health issues. All of them are desperately poor. So when Antoine, Antoine was gravely ill and required hospitalization, followed by taking medication daily, there was no one in his network who was able to be of help to him by providing him with a safe place where he could keep his medications, let alone helping to remind him to take them every day. And in fact, there was no one who could show up for a hospital visit without kind of creating a whole incident around that visit. So from our vantage point, it seems that Antoine is possibly more stable and capable than the majority of other people in his circle, and that they are the ones to rely on him more so than vice versa. So why did I bring us here to conclude? Um, I wanted to end with this overview of Antoine and his loved ones and with these photos precisely to bring us back to the big picture that a lot of other people have talked about today of neighborhood level of poverty, violence, and misery. These photos represent the neighborhoods that Michael's talking to us about where you just can't go any farther down than this. Um, and it's important to remember that the con this is the context in which pre-incarceration and reincarceration are happening, which makes for a very complicated picture. So we were talking last night at dinner about how people often kind of want this conclusive, like incarceration is bad for health or incarceration is beneficial for health. Um, and that's just really not the conversation we can have or need to have because we need to frame incarceration in the abysmal life conditions of our nation's poor and the physical and emotional suffering that people are enduring, whether they're behind the bars of a correctional facility or whether they're behind the gates of the jungle. So rather than any pretense of answers, uh, I hope that what I've left you with today is a sense of the multidirectional, nuanced, and complex effects that one person's incarceration can have on a loved one's health. And I also very much hope that I've made the case for the critical need for multi-tiered studies that meaningfully combine a, a view from above with high-level statistics and a view from the ground with fine-grained observations as we tackle one of the most critical issues of our age. So again, I thank the organizers so much for having us. Um, there's a lot of work to do, and I very much look forward to doing doing it with those of you here. Thank you. And I thought I'd sneak the minute in, the extra minute while everybody's coming up to um, have the acknowledgement slide. So I want to acknowledge the people who have funded us. Definitely my colleagues in the Urban Health Study. Hi to Zima, I know you're watching. <laughs> I have people in the San Francisco office who promised they would be watching us. Um, and as I say, Jennifer Lorvik is here. Hetty Lee and uh, Christopher Wildeman, whom you'll be hearing from tomorrow, did the statistical analyses on the couples data I was presenting. And then, of course, all of our participants with whom we couldn't, without whom we couldn't do anything. Thank you.